Welcome to Medical Memories, the podcast where we discover the fascinating facts of healthcare and explore the amazing journeys of healthcare professionals. I am your host Jabirul, a medical student passionate about connecting you with the medical world. In each episode, we sit down with incredible individuals who bring a unique blend of expertise, passion and empathy to the world of medicine. Together, we navigate the intricate connections between science and humanity, uncovering the unsung stories that make healthcare full of experiences worth sharing. In today's episode with Dr. Georgi Megaladze, who is a clinical microbiologist as well as a gastroenterologist, we discuss about antibiotics, the resistance to antibiotics while discussing about hospital acquired infections. And now, let's dive into today's episode. Hello, sir. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. How are you? I'm actually doing quite amazing. How about you? Yeah, I'm okay also. Yes, it's the time of the time of the year which you love, right? It's the winters. Yeah, it's it's the winter. I actually really lo- love the winter. It's amazing. Uh, mostly, like I love the cold because I cannot tolerate the heat. Yes, also it's the time for skiing. A lot of barbecues. Yeah. yeah, I actually really like the meat and also the skiing. So I can't wait for the ski season to start to, for me to go skiing and all. We'll I hope there will be enough snow. So. Yep, absolutely. You know, actually having you on the podcast is actually a bit of a different experience for me because you have been <laughs> teaching us microbiology since third and fourth a semester. Mm. And all of the students actually are scared of you to some extent. <laughs> Really? <laughs> yes, they are. Oh, thank you for inviting me in the po- podcast. So, why they are scared, scared of me? Like, I know I kind of am a little bit harsh or like don't like to give the points that easily, but yes, it's I don't, mainly I don't because of the points. Look very scared. <laughs> mainly because of because of the points and the way you uh, take assessments for us. Like, you have some of the best uh, questions, in my opinion. I love them. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, uh, you are also a clinical microbiologist, also a gastroenterologist, and also a PhD student, right? Yeah, I started with like a clinical microbiology when I finished the university. Then I uh, went to the residency in gastroenterology about a three years, and right now I'm doing the PhD in microbiology. It's mostly uh, nosocomial pneumonias, so <laughs> I'm not wasting my time. <laughs> That's actually I quite interesting. Right. So how did you decide that you want to do residency in gastroenterology? Because you were um, a microbiologist beforehand. I always wanted to microbiology and I started like uh, when I finished medical university, I finished the Tbilisi State Medical University in 2017. Then I went to the microbiology for two years and then I decided to want to become a doctor and then I went to the residency after that. And now I finished the residency and I started the PhD. I started working on PhD when I was a resident and right now I'm uh, I finished my first year of PhD mm-hmm. and well I hope I'll finish in two years. <laughs> I hope. So it's a little bit difficult to finish like to finish the PhD in three years. Uh, for me it's like I'm think I'm on track, but I, it might get delayed, but well we'll see. <laughs> Yep, I wish you all so, the best in your basic journey. Oh, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, since you are specializing in nosocomial pneumonia. Yeah, uh, it's a hospital acquired pneumonia. Yeah, hospital acquired pneumonia. Yeah. Uh, so how yeah. does it relate to gastroenterology? No, nah, no, it does not <laughs> at all. It does not relate to gastroenterology at all. It's like... Um, it was a, a subject I was working on during the coronavirus, and I noticed that there were some too, too many uh, resistant bacteria compared to some other um, countries. And well, I decided to that would be my topic because there was a lot of uh, research material, and I started doing that. So, yeah, it's mostly my uh, part of my clinical microbiology. It has nothing to do with the gastroenterology, <laughs> so it's completely separate. Okay, I understand. Mm. Actually, this part of pneumonia is actually very interesting to me as well, because there is constant mutations 
and with each season we need new vaccines yeah like uh, the pneumonias are very common it is becoming more common in nowadays because of uh, immune depression also there's a like uh, so nutrient deprived people and immune compromised people and they are more susceptible to like um, getting a pneumonia and well uh, especially in hospital segment because in mostly developing countries the hospital acquired pneumonias are very common the reason is because uh, the guidelines are not yet well usually they do not follow the guidelines properly and also um, there are many problems in developing countries and that also increases the chances of acquiring uh, 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 pneumonia inside the hospitals which is usually multi-drug resistant. The most common microbes I found were like Pseudomonas, Acinetobacters, uh, Klebsiella and there was like an aureus also Sotococcus pneumonia and yeah, those microbes were very common and most of them were like, of course, the multi-drug resistant. And the problem with that is that uh, we don't have enough research in developing countries because it uh, takes a lot of money and we don't have the accurate numbers. Uh, we have a numbers of the United States or the western part of Europe, which uh, do the research very often and we know how the resistance are there. But it's mostly unclear how the resistance is in developing countries. And of course, Georgia is the developing country and they're like, there was uh, the large research has not yet been done here in uh, Georgia. Also, well, I every time I search in in the internet about what type of researches were done, and usually they, they are very slim. And uh, the researches I uh, find are usually in a short number of people. Even my mm -hmm. research focuses on about like a uh, 400 patients, which is not that large. It should be like 10,000, 20,000 or something like that to get like a accurate reading. Yes. So, yeah. And that's uh, usually a subject that <clears throat> needs to be covered in future because the resistance is actually a very big problem. Yes, it's kind of I don't... every single, like every single month we have like new strains. Yeah, not just the new strains. It's like the, the bacteria are able to exchange their uh, resistant genes, and uh, it's really common in bacteria to gain a resistance in in an instant. So even if like person takes antibiotics normally, usually our normal microbiome develops a resistance, and when we get invaded by a sort of like pathogenic bacteria, they can exchange their genes to that bacteria, and then uh, we we are becoming infected with a resistant strain. And the thing is, we we still have some antibiotics which can treat those infections, uh, but there are some infections which are not we are not able to treat. For example, like um, Pseudomonas or Acinetobacters are now becoming the multi-drug resistant, and I found like multiple of those bacteria which are resistant to all existing antibiotics, even the colistin. Yeah, and that's like uh, common occurrence in Georgia and mostly in the d developing countries because we don't have proper guidelines how to prescribe antibiotics. We do have the guidelines, but usually um, the treatment starts from um, very uh, like reserve antibiotics, which already is a big problem. And yeah, some stuff needs to be uh, fixed to sort of like uh, delay the resistance, uh, the delay the development of the resistance. Yes, and so, one yeah, more thing it's... which I believe is that uh, when doctors prescribe medicines or antibiotics to people and as soon as they see that I'm already recovering, so why should I take the entire course of the medicine? No, uh, usually the antibiotics when someone, well, if you have been prescribed the full dose of the antibiotics, usually uh, if it's a seven day curse, you should take the seven day curse because if you do not take the seven day curse, you will get uh, the resist. There's a really high chance of developing a resistance because if you are infected with the bacteria and all those bacteria do not die, they will develop a resistance. And after um, that, if you do not complete the treatment, second time that antibiotic that you have been prescribed might be resistant and yeah, that bacteria course. might be resistant to that antibiotic which you were taking it previously so that's also a, a very important factor that if you have been prescribed antibiotics you must finish the entire course if you stop it 
then it will be it will be very bad. So uh, also like uh, prescri prescription of the I prescription of the antibiotics is a little bit um, problematic because in the uh, European countries and the United States they usually do not prescribe antibiotics very easily unless they have a confirmation that that patient usually has uh, a bacterial infection. Um, for instance, like uh, I've seen multiple times that people uh, like uh, the doctors prescribe antibiotics for the sore throat yes. and usually sore throat is caused by the viruses i don't mean the children okay in children there's a sort of cactus pyogenes hemophilus influenza those ones can cause bacterial pharyngitis yes. but in the adults it's usually caused by the viruses and when you like and those viruses do not cause a pneumonia and uh, only like influenza virus can lead to a bacterial pneumonia but prescribing antibiotics for the prevention of bacterial pneumonia is not that good mm -hmm. and well that's uh, that's the thing like for the sore throat for the pharyngitis you should determine if it's a viral or bacterial pharyngitis and if it is a bacterial pharyngitis then you prescribe the antibiotics but if it's not a bacterial pharyngitis you stick with with like uh, symptomatic treatment and in most of the cases, like probably the 99% of the cases, it's the viral pharyngitis. And no, you don't need antibiotics for that. And usually people have a sensation that um, uh, when they take antibiotics, they get well. But usually the viral pharyngitis lasts about like four to five days. And if you start mm -hmm. taking antibiotics after two days, in the three days you will get well. And they are, well, um, saying that antibiotics helped. But actually it's because it's the the disease has already over and it's like it's coarse so yeah it's kind of making it yeah. a pattern for people so every time they believe mm. that they are starting to have a strep throat they just take medicines mm. and antibiotics but instead yeah. they should not do it without confirmation of course without the confirmation you should never take antibiotics and uh on like there's a some percentage that antibiotics can prevent the people from having a pneumonia but I don't think that it's enough for them to take antibiotics that easily. So that's that's not just my opinion. You can like everyone can look at the internet and will we'll look at a bunch of articles regarding do antibiotics prevent pneumonia or they don't, and they will find very interesting uh, answers about that. So yeah, actually. Uh, so, in your opinion, uh, which kind of hospital-acquired infections are the most common or like they are the most uh, difficult ones to cure? Uh, mostly are the gram-negative gram bacteria like Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas aeruginosa or Acinetobacter baumani and Klebsiella pneumonia. Those three are actually the most resistant ones, which I have encountered because uh, in cases of Staphylococcus aureus, um, we usually can use the anti like reserve antibiotics like linezolid or quinopristine plus alphapristine or um, like vancomycin, for instance. Mm -hmm. But if you take the gram-negative bacteria like the Acinetobacter baumani, Klebsiella, like yeah. the last resort antibiotic is usually a cholestin, and we see the resistance to cholestin very not very often, but yeah, we see it. Uh, it is becoming more often in nowadays, and we can see that. Usually, Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter are the most resistant bacteria that you can find in the clinical yeah, the, uh, and hospital environment. Multiple drug resistant at the same time. Because yeah, MDR, like not just multiple, they can be like super bugs, which are resistant to all existing antibiotics. All and in that case, usually, patient, well, is, we are not able to treat the patient in that case. So let's suppose that so let's suppose that there is a patient who goes to the hospital and he's admitted mm -hmm. in the ICU or in the some kind of form. So what steps can the patient or the uh, his family members can take which will help him uh, not get hospital acquired infections? <laughs> well, that's the uh, key because um, thing is in the there are the guidelines how the doctors should um, sort of like follow uh, to. Um, to what to do to not may not allow patient to get the hospital acquired infections the thing is the first and most important rule is that everything must be sterile 
Sterile mm. means that when you intubate the patient, you should intubate correctly and do not contaminate the tube. Or when you do the urinary catheter, you must not contaminate the urinary catheter. When the patient is uh, on a, um, has like a, uh, uh, like um, supportive respiratory treat treatment, like when uh, the patient is on a um, respiratory support, that machine must not be contaminated. And there's are many other factors. The most problematic thing is the biofilms. Like bi when the biofilms are created on those uh, foreign bodies, let's uh, call them like that, like in the intubation tube or in the catheter, they are not being killed by the antibiotics because the foreign, like those biofilms, do not allow antibiotics to go inside that uh, and kill the bacteria, and that's why biofilms stay there. And then those biofilms infect uh, urinary tract, and from the urinary tract they will infect the kidneys, and from the kidneys they will go to the blood, and then we have a sepsis and the IC, and etc. etc. Same goes. Uh, to to the like intubation tube like we get pneumonia then sepsis and the end product will be the respiratory failure or of course the IC and uh, like toxic shock and stuff like that so usually the uh, everything must be cleaned properly doctors and nurses should be very careful to not contaminate the uh, sort of like uh, machines and samples and everything uh, and the third one is that when one of the patients develops the uh, pulmonary infection, for example, like from the uh, pseudomonas or AC interbacter or like Klebsiella, they must be isolated in a different room. Because if they stay in the same room as the other patients, they usually create aerosols mm -hmm. pro from the lungs and they can infect other patients. Uh, in developed countries, they are, are have completely uh, in completely fix that and when a patient has a confirmation of the hospital acquired pneumonia they are usually isolated uh, in georgia they are not isolated they are still in the room with other patients which also increases the chance of other patients getting that uh, uh, same bacterial infection and the result i i've seen this multiple times when i was working as a clinical microbiologist that uh, multiple patients in the same hospital had the same bacterial infection. And well, that was, uh, and that's like a um, common occurrence in most, in all the developing countries, mostly. So, yeah. Yes, indeed. You know, and it's like a more. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, and yeah, yeah I'm going to finish that. And, Usually, fixing that requires uh, education first, what is most important. Uh, also, like um, proper salary uh, for the doctors because they need to care about the, of course, every doctor should care about the patient, but still, like when you work too many hours and you get still get uh, uh, like uh, not enough amount of salary, it's usually. Um, sort of uh, damages your motivation and usually uh, when you're t also very tired you can make more mistakes and that's usually really bad yes there has so, to yeah. be a work and also how much they are getting compensated right yeah of course and as we mentioned that in developing countries it's more common right uh, what do you think of yeah. people who come as visitors to visit the patients yeah, the uh, visiting hours should be really strict. Like the usually healthy individuals are not completely protected from the hospital acquired infections, but if you are healthy, you don't get the hospital acquired infection. They are not that common to acquire. Most of them require, like I said, the foreign bodies inserted into the patient to get infected, like uh, intubation tube or also like urinary catheter or like catheters in general or like foreign bodies like the hip replacement surgery or like uh, artificial heart valves and stuff like that. So usually healthy individuals are mostly don't get infected. But thing is, healthy individuals can bring new infections inside the hospital. Yes. That's the problem. Uh, the visiting hours should be strict, like it should be strict, especially in children. Like, uh, because children are very fragile, their immune system is low, like they are not Im completely Im immune compromised, but compared to adults, their immune system is really low. They are more susceptible to more infections. So that's why children should get like, um, should be more strict in children compared to adults but yeah still like there's a specific guidelines about the visiting hours and everyone should follow that mm -hmm. it's like i know that 
the like patient's relatives care about the patient, but they are doing more wrong rather than good to the patient because they might bring some viruses. And uh, I've seen this multiple times when a recovering patient received the viral infection from, from, from some of the relatives and then, well, patient situation got much worse because of that. And yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, it becomes like a chain, right? Like someone comes today and then yeah. tomorrow, like the more people that come to visit, the more chances we have of infections. Yeah, of course, like it's very common. Yeah, in your... And, well, yeah. yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 yeah. I, I, I just couldn't feel what you just said. Yes. Uh, in your like practice, have you ever seen like a very strange case or maybe the most interesting one yet? Yeah, it was multiple. Like I've seen the Crimean Congo hemorrhage fever once, which was pretty interesting. Uh, also like rabies, but in some countries rabies is very common, right? Yes. So yeah, in, in Georgia it's not that common. It's like we have a few cases every year or maybe like one case every four years or something like that. Um, as for the strangest cases, I've seen like... Uh, um, a more, uh, like uh, cytomegalovirus causing the hepatitis in immunocompromised patient, which is actually very rare. Uh, and then most of the cases, like uh, as a gastroenterologist, mostly I see the, is, is the gastritis caused by the helicobacter pylori or gastritis caused by the stress or mostly it's a gastritis or also some diarrheas. Uh, the most the strangest diarrhea I've seen probably was the Yersinia tricolitica, which is a little bit rare, but yeah. And uh, mostly I, I have never had like a very uh, rare cases like that yet because I'm not that old. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, tubercul oh, um, no, yeah, that's about it. Not that kind of strange case. Mostly like. Gastritis. As for the resistance bacteria, yeah, I've seen many of those. And uh, it depends on what you call a strange case. Like, I've yes. also seen a Listeria infection, Listeria meningitis, which is not that rare. Um, hmm, that's it probably. Well, if if I find some, some of the strange cases, I might release an article about it. So. <laughs> Yes, we'll be expecting I still something. haven't seen one. <laughs> uh, and how about uh, gastroenterology? Like, have you, like, what do you think? What can, what are certain habits that people can have, which will actually ha help them to have better gut health? Mostly to diet and sleep. Uh, diet, I mean, like, uh, you don't need to eat a lot of uh, uh High, quant high amounts of food at the same time because it's usually overstretches the stomach. Also, starvation is really bad and uh, smoking is also really bad for, for the stomach. And uh, mostly what I see nowadays is that most of the people have a hiatal hernia. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, they're... So, like, um, hiatal hernia usually leads to uh, the gastritis and also like uh, regurgitation, like GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And it's a really common in, uh, in nowadays, in today's world, it's really common. Usually like people uh, don't eat properly because of the high, uh, like um, high amount of stress and also overworking. Because you eat once a day and you eat a high amount of food in a one day. So usually stomachs overstretches and it usually gives them all this. Also, like the people who are sleep deprived, they have a stress and usually they have a gastritis. And every time they wake up in the morning, they might have a, like a heartburn or they have a sensation that something is like uh, uncomfortable feeling in the stomach. And that usually results in uh, gastritis. Um, yeah. So mostly also, it's because of uh, the stretching of the stomach, right? Not just mostly stretching of the stomach, most like uh, improper, like that's the one of the reasons. But also the reason is that, well, um, the food quality is low in sometimes. Mostly when people eat the uh, fast food or like junk food, it's not that good for your health. Also high fatty content, also like 
um, high amounts of um, acid content, like uh, some food have a high a acidic properties, and usually it damages the stomach. The stomach damage is usually done either by uh, overproducing of the acids in the stomach, like, uh, or it's uh, uh, decretion of the repair factors, like some like COX-1 and COX-2 genes, which yes. is, are, is usually the result of the NSAU. So high mm -hmm. NSAUs and the many factors, but mostly it's based on like a uh, he, uh, people's lifestyle. So, yeah, and the treating the patient with the gastritis or the GI problems is complex because it's they not just have to take the drugs daily. That's not a big problem. Everyone can do it. The problem is changing their lifestyle, and most of the patients unfortunately do not do that, and usually the disease still there and they are not able to completely defeat that disease so yes and in fact i've a, a seen a couple of my friends who take stress and it causes a headache <laughs> for them so they take aspirin which decreases yeah. expression and they have you know some mm. kind of uh, custom cast uh, ulcers or some kind of gerd and yeah, I, it becomes like a cycle for them yeah of course like i also had a grd when i was a student medical student so I didn't slept well, uh, of course. I didn't took any kind of NSAIDs, but I had like gastritis because of probably not sleeping. I slept like five to four hours a day for a span of many weeks and usually ended up having like uh, gastritis. So, yeah, but I, I probably fixed that. So, <laughs> yes, now nowadays I've you know seen that you are a lot more into hiking. And I've even seen you uh, yeah. riding bikes. <laughs> yeah, I mostly uh, try to stay very active. I'm like a very active person. I, I probably work work out every day, daily, like one or two hours. That's like nothing because people scroll Facebook for one or two hours. It's not going to waste my time. I don't usually, I don't use a social media a lot, probably none. I mostly... Mm, focus on working and to do some hiking or like workout. I try to stay very active. So mm -hmm. it's also really good for like mind and health. So benefits. And, yeah, it actually benefits both the mind and the body. <laughs> yeah. And how do you find the time to do research for your ongoing PhD journey? Um, is it like thing is that I have real time research that you see people? Hey, I have a question. About no, no, no. Yes. My research is already done. Uh, it's I finished the research about a few months ago. It was a um, it was a one year research. I, I researched about 400 patients who had hospital acquired pneumonia, and that was it. Right now, I'm just writing and f publishing articles mm -hmm. and going to the university. I'm also a student, so <laughs> yeah, I'm learning in the university. I'm publishing my articles, and that's. What I'm doing right now. So, but the research isn't done. But that was a really tough one year of my life. So, yes. But right now it's much more settled. Yeah, but I didn't know that you were also a student. Can you also talk more about that? Yeah, like uh, I, <laughs> it's sort of like being a. Uh, I'm a, I started the medical university in 2011, and I never stopped being a student. <laughs> So I was a student in six years, then I was uh, uh, in clinical microbiology, then I became a resident, there was it's also a student, so, and now I'm a PhD student. So, yeah, even though it's a PhD, it's, you are still a student. I still have a student card. <laughs> That's actually quite, you know, quite interesting. And as doctors, we can never stop learning. There is new cases. Yeah. New uh, no, it, it never recently. ends. Yes. It never ends. never ends. The studying never ends. If you think that after the six years, or plus the six years of the residency, or even more, or PhD, it never it never stops. It never does stop. So, well, yeah, that's and the thing that you have to <laughs> yeah, realize. Kind of that, yeah, and I believe that's there, the, that's the reason why you know we should have hobbies. Yeah, of course. You go insane if you don't have a hobby. Yeah, it will make your life very monotonous. Yeah, I would yeah. love to hear about your hobbies. Well, first of all, uh, if you can call it a hobby, because I listen to music a lot. 
So that also really helps me to calm my mind and well focus on stuff. When I work, I when I write or when I work, of course I mostly listen to music uh, and I also well um, into like I'm, but I mostly listen to one type of music. It's a like rock it's rock. 60s 70s and 80s rock so i don't listen any, to anything else like that's my thing and i don't listen to anything else but that that's the music is my hobby also hiking probably but i don't like hiking with a lot, a lot of people mostly alone or with my one or two friends and that's it because uh, the multiple people is like kind of uh exhausting <laughs> so i try to also, I like skiing a lot, uh, and also I game sometimes. <laughs> what kind so, of games yeah. do you play? Uh, mostly, I play with my friends. It's like shooters, probably. Yeah, shooters. But I don't like pl playing alone. Mostly, I play with my friends. So if they are available, and if I am available, <laughs> sometimes we might do some gaming. But. Uh, it, in nowadays, it, it, it is becoming a rare occasion, unfortunately. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, also, well, also, I play basketball. I run marathons. Uh, yeah, I do mostly. I do like physical activity a lot. That's probably my hobby. So, listening to music and doing some physical activity. Yes. So, you know, I have even I have I did some research about sound and frequencies. And the frequency of music that we hear also influences our performance, mental as well as physical. So I believe that is why you also mm. listen to rock, right? It it give it gives the yeah, motivation and energy. <laughs> I never thought about that, to be honest. But yeah, I kind of uh, yeah, I'm really into music, so mm, probably that's true because I have never I have never thought about that how it affects. It probably has a really uh, large effect on my life, what type of music I listen. And uh, sometimes it improves my mood, actually. And well, uh, but yeah, one brand of music is my thing. Like, I cannot listen to anything else. Yes. So, yeah. Actually, I have I know some very... la like, Yeah. Ahead, <laughs> no, 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 continue. Yeah, I had a question about uh, the enteric nervous system. Mm. Can you yeah. tell us more about that? Because it's it's, it's actually Anteri a very interesting. It's actually a very interesting concept, right? The nervous system. The enteric nerve. Sorry, can you? The uh, nervous system of the gut. The enteric nervous yeah. system. Yeah. About like when you're hungry, your mood is actually really bad. My mood is also really bad when I'm hungry. Uh, mostly about. It depends on like I quite, I'm not very good at that. I have never done any research about the enteric neuro, neural system or have any kind of interest. But I've noticed some few things about that. If someone is hungry, they usually have bad mood. Uh, even though I like I like eating a I, I do like eating and also I'm I'm trying to cook. You know oh yeah and one of my hobbies is also cooking. So, but I only cook meat. And yes. some, so, so, sometimes a pasta, but yeah. Uh, but I'm not very uh, food dependent compared to some other people. Like if I get hungry, I don't. I don't think it's gonna change my mood. I just get tired. But some people, I, I know people who are actually, if, if if they're hungry, you're not able to talk to them because they are actually angry. Uh, and also, like some food will get you. Uh, Get get you bloated, or some food might get you sort of like uh, feeling heavy. But yeah, to be honest, like I don't know much of think about the enteric neural system or like <laughs> connection between those two. Uh, to be honest, like my main focus right now is about uh, C diff infection, the Clostridium difficile infection in the GI tract, because uh, there's a lot of antibiotic using uh, Georgia and. A lot of people have C. diff infection, and we're trying to implement the uh, sort of like stool, um, uh, like uh, uh, um, stool banking, because it's uh, like a, a implantation of the intestinal flora to, uh, to the patients who have C. diff infection. So, yeah, 
and that's mostly my uh, main uh, focus <laughs> in in the gastroenterology right now. Yeah. So, uh, do you have? Do you think that people have some kind of misconceptions, uh, some kind of you know misbeliefs in this oh. in this area of gut health? Yeah, they do have some misbeliefs. Like I've seen a lot of diets which are completely useless. Uh, usually, dieting is uh, should like it should be done individually. Because, uh, for example, uh, having knew that the one in every four page uh, four people is lactose intolerance, and usually, if you if the lactose intolerant patient or person drinks milk or sort of like it's the dairy products, they usually get some kind of symptoms. It's not always like you get a diarrhea all the time. No, you might get a bloating. You might get like incomplete uh, digestion of the uh, da dairy products, which is which increases the toxin production and which is really bad for your health. Also, some people cannot eat fish, for example, not because they, they uh, cannot tolerate it, but because they don't like it. So yeah, the Diets should be prescribed individually. Also, like if someone is on a vegan diet, they must take uh, vitamin supplements because they are not found in the vegetables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like those kind of stuff should be done individually. And when some person like uh, tells you on the internet that this diet is ideal, no, the, every diet should be prescribed individually. Individual. Yeah, of course, that's the no-brainer. Um, so. There's a lot, lot of like false information in the internet about the food and stuff. Like some food is good, some food is bad. But uh, there's no like ideal food that will tell you that this is amazing. Like some people are allergic to that food, some people aren't. If you are allergic, you don't eat that food. If you aren't allergic, of course, it's good for you. For example, like uh, eating the you know, fruit is... I best, right? It's great. There's a lot of fibers, vitamins, everything. But there are some people who are allergic to the fruits, what they can do, right? So yeah, mostly uh, there should be dietitians and they must prescribe a diet to the individual person. Or like, if you have enough knowledge, you can do it by yourself. But what I see nowadays is that people are lazy. They don't like to do the research. They don't like to experiment. They just need like raw information and that's it. I'm going to do it because yeah. someone else has done it. No, you should do research by yourself. You need to know why are you doing that. And when you understand that, it will be much easier for you to well, do the diet and even do workouts. Like this works. If it doesn't work, then do that. And well, it's simple, but it needs reading and it needs research. And yeah, people don't like to do that. They like to follow the influencers and what they tell them. And <laughs> that's for me. It's like I don't like that. That's why I mostly don't don't use the social. Like I kind of post something, but I don't post any kind of like uh, do that and uh, this is good for your health or something like that. Oh. And I also don't read the social media stuff. Yeah, it's kind of distracting because when you have so much to do and you get the smaller distraction, your whole mood can be influenced by it. Yeah, of course. Like um, I've seen like people um, watch the TikTok for 10 hours straight or like some one of my friends, like he downloaded the TikTok and he went all night watching some videos even though he uh, sh should have gone to work at 8 p.m., <laughs> so 8 a.m., and he wasn't watching the TikTok all night. So I cannot do that. It's like too boring for me, or even the yeah. social media is too and boring. And I think it can also cause stress, which can even lower the health of your gut, right? Yeah, of course. Like uh, it depends. Some people did cause the stress, some people it doesn't, but. I don't know, like, I'm not a um, neurologist, nor like, psychologist, nor <laughs> psychiatrist. It's For me, I know that it's boring, and I don't like it, so. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just curious, uh, what tips would you give to medical students, uh, which, uh, like, let's suppose, for me, I'm a third year medical student, right? So mm -hmm. what tips would you have for third year or fourth year medical students? Uh, consistency is the key, actually. Uh, for me, it was all, I, I don't know, like, it's a, every person is individual. For me, like, I'm not very good at memorizing stuff 
in one day or so like I needed the consistency to get to learn. Like I had a sort of like uh, schedule every day. I studied two to three hours a day, every day. I did not skip the, skip the day. I never studied like five, six or seven hours straight. I just started like two to three hours every single day, which seems to be working where like it worked actually really well because I finished the university, I finished the residency, I am clinical microbiologist and now I'm a PhD student. So yeah, it worked for me, but for some individuals that might not work because they might re can uh, like study for seven hours straight or something like that, but mostly consistency. You must have some kind of consistency. And uh, usually when you think that I can learn this in a one day, no, you can't. It's impossible. And the most important thing, books, no videos. No, like you need to understand how to read the books and how to understand what is written in the books. The problem what I see in the medical students nowadays is that they are not, they don't know how to read the book. The reading the book, it's not a story. Like the, the medical uh, textbooks are not the story to read. It's a learning material. You need to learn those. Mostly you need to understand the mechanisms, how everything works, and then you will understand how everything goes. Um, and that's like, they don't, like the medical students usually don't know how to work with the book and they need to understand how to do that. And uh, it will be very beneficial. And PowerPoints and stuff? No. <laughs> you know I don't like the, giving the PowerPoints, right? Because yes. it's usually uh, students try, try to think that I'm going to read those like 20 slides and I'm going to finish, uh, like uh, I'll be ready for, for the midterm or for the exam. But usually there's like 50 pa page reading and 30 PowerPoint slides won't going to help you. Yes. Mostly, like I said, the consistency. And uh, you need to, like, you need to realize uh, at an er early time what you want to become. And you need to strive for that. And when you do that, you can, you must have a goal at the end, what you want to become. And then, well, uh, when that goal is inside, you will do it. And how do you think Everything is, is achievable. Yes. Uh, and how can you decide, how can a student decide that this is something he wants to pursue? Like which, so what, um, is, uh, let's suppose there are students in the uh, in the medical field, right? So how can they decide that this is the niche that I want to go in? Um, I actually, uh, it's kind of like for me, it was it was a feeling. I never liked surgery, and also like uh, my hands don't work like the surgeon's hands. Like they are steady, but they're a little bit larger, so. And also I did not like the surgery because I thought it wasn't like, um, for me, um, being a physician was much more important because I can, uh, I was very good at the fig uh, figuring out, in, out the mechanisms, also uh, figuring out uh, different kind of puzzles. And that I think that that was really good for me. I, well, and gastroenterology was one of those subjects and that's why I chose it. So yeah, you like, it's easy to fi um, figure out what you're good at and what you like doing and you should pursue it. Uh, and well, there's a many parts of the medicine that you can pursue. Like you can do research, you can do surgery, you can do psychiatry, you can do uh, like uh, pharmacy, uh, like uh, pathology, everything. Like there's a many, uh, areas that you can fo focus on and well it yeah, will be like it does come from the but, inside yeah yeah of course like after you finish the first three years you probably will figure out what you want to do yes that's like based like three years you you're gonna figure out what you're good at and then you're gonna follow what you want to do so and oh, there's like sports, sports medicine also, and <laughs> yeah, there is sports medicine. It's and it's kind of growing. Yeah, it's kind of like nowadays it's really important to be honest. Like sports medicine, uh, I haven't noticed like so many people being interested in the sport, sports medicine. Uh, like it's 
in nowadays. And uh, the sport is becoming, I think that uh, sport is becoming more and more popular in nowadays. Yeah. Like all those, all those like the bodybuilders, the CrossFit guys. Also, we have the football, rugby, basketball, and a bunch of other stuff. So, yeah, that's really good. Yes, even uh, biohacking and getting the maximum performance <laughs> for each game. Yeah. Also, we have like steroid problems, the performance enhan enhancing drugs, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> yes. And we're coming to the end of the of the call, and I have just one last question for you. Sure. So let's suppose you had a chance to leave behind something in this world, and so what would it be? Something that you learned, discovered, or you made it? What would it be? <laughs> I actually don't know. <laughs> It's kind of a strange question. Not a strange question. Like you need to think about that to answer that question. Um, I like. I want to discover something. <laughs> like some kind of micro, probably. Or like discover the super bug, which will be resistant to all the microbes and all. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, let's I want. Yeah. Let's put it this way. Let's suppose that you had the choice to have only one antibiotic for yourself for the rest of your life. Which <laughs> antibiotic would it be? Or which drug would it so be? Ceftriaxone. Ceftriaxone. Yeah. Is That's like problem. most useful antibiotic there is. There's a high efficiency, but works both on the gram positive and gram negative. And usually resistance is it's average. It's, it's an average regarding the... Um, Resisting the resistance of the bacteria, so yeah, the safe drug. Yeah, it's one of the very Indeed. powerful drugs. Uh, it's the most efficient drug, and that's why it's uh, it has a one of the lowest MI, uh, MBCs, the minimum bacterial concentration compared to all antibiotics. It's the most efficient. That's why it's the most po popular drug because it uh, gives you the uh, high results in a shorter amount of time and in a shorter amount of do dosages. So that's why it's most popular. It's a first line of treatment for pneumonia, it's a first line treatment for gonorrhea, it's a first line treatment for meningitis, bacterial meningitis, of course. It's like it's like the big gun. Yeah. Yeah, sort of it is like yeah. it's one of the great uh, great antibiotics. Yeah. All right, so that's the end for our interview. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for coming on the podcast. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. <laughs> and actually, Goodbye and good luck. The... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, what it is was it? a very interesting conversation with you. Yeah. Likewise. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And that concludes another episode of Medical Memoirs. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to subscribe, leave a review, and also share it with your friends and fellow colleagues. Remember, we are here to empower your health journey, bridge knowledge gaps, and also promote health equity. Until next time, this is Jabirul signing off from Medical Memoirs. Take care and be safe.